Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is a very interesting one on biblical missionaries. Could you name some of those? Well, this lesson is about Jesus and his missionary efforts. It's lesson number seven in this series for August 15 of 2015. And I hope you have your Bible handy because you want, might want to check out some of these verses. But uh, assuming you have it ready, let's begin with a word of prayer. Our loving Father, when you came down to this earth and lived the life that you lived and represented Father, Son, and Holy Spirit through your activities, we recognize that this was the longest distance missionary trip that's ever been made. Help us to recognize what Jesus did and find ways in which we can copy his example as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Since Satan's rebellion in heaven, the Trinity, you know, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, have had to deal with misrepresentations, accusations, and lies. When human beings joined Satan's side by accepting his lies at the tree, God initiated a plan that had been set in place from eternity to rescue humanity. Their goal is to, once again, restore humanity to full unity with divinity. Now, I realize that what I've just said is real heresy to a nonsense to a lot of people who don't believe that God can predict the future, but I absolutely believe that he can predict the future and that he set up a plan way before this earth was created to provide for us. That, of course, is supported by a number of texts in Scripture. Well, we know that <coughs> for whatever reason, and we think there's a very good reason, <coughs> history was split in two by the coming of Jesus. We, of course, know <coughs> as B.C. and A.D. He set aside his divinity. He took upon himself human nature to reach us in our deep need, and he recognized the passage from Philippians 2. The issues in the great controversy were resolved by clear and decisive answers to Satan's lies and accusations. Now you wonder where I'm going with this. I'm saying a real missionary needs to carry this kind of message, right? Well, that made it possible for us to go on our mission to the world with intellectually convincing and powerful arguments about God's character and government. I personally believe that the Seventh-day Adventist Church, with the assistance and direction of Ellen White, is the only religious organization that has these issues straight. Scriptures point out three main reasons, or three main methods we're supposed to use in this carrying out that mission. And does, does the church have all the messages straight? You did have to ask that, didn't you? <laughs> well, obviously, our church, if you look at our worldwide organization with somewhere close to 20 million people, there's a huge spectrum from those who are just beginning Christians and to those who have been studying Christianity all their life. And so um, we, can't, we don't speak as a monolithic group. That's very clear. Um, now, so then I have to ask you, well, who has the right to speak on our behalf? I do, of course. <laughs> okay. In yeah, that case, I think the church is here. the church. We're safe here. Okay. Yeah, that's right. So I, the church is in pretty good hands, right? <laughs> well, yes. But Ken, my understanding is that we want to form a unity, a unity with with Jesus Christ. Yes. And if we, I, I think the goal is is to have the mind of Jesus Christ. Absolutely. And if, if we individually have the mind of Jesus Christ, will we not be in harmony? We will, if we all have mind of Jesus Christ. Wouldn't of course, if we... Man, mind of Jesus Christ? Well, that's a, that's that's a biblical, definition. that's a biblical expression. I know, but still, when you read it from the Bible, you're gonna come up with some sort of... Like, having the mind of Jesus Christ means you've come to think like him. And that's what John 17, the whole, yeah. the Lord's per, well, real Lord's Prayer is all about. Yeah, and the more you and, and like him, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're, I mean, and let's be honest, 
we're going to do more and more of that for the rest of eternity. It's, it's, the, it's the new covenant. Yeah. It's, 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 it's an expression of Is the that, covenant. when you say that, though, it seems like everything, everything, when you talk about the mind of Jesus Christ, you're talking about everything he can think of. That's right. Is everything that we can think of. But it, if I would agree with it if it's like what you were saying there. Well, um, it, it impacts this, everything we do, everything we think, everything. Yeah, it does. But, but you and me don't agree on everything. Well. I don't agree with And, and unfortunately, with it's, also, everybody. it's also Every, true that you and I don't agree with Jesus on everything. Well, that could be. But <laughs> it could I be. Think it I, is. I think no I'm question. a little closer than you. I see. Okay. Well, if, uh, if we're becoming more and more, then you can't become more if you aren't at least a little less. I've said that. So, a little less? How are you going to well, you can't, handle a little you less for eternity? Uh, yeah, but if you, if you, <laughs> if you, if you, you can't become more if there's nothing to add yeah, to. And so that's that's a recognition that um, we don't all necessarily. It's a learning process, and there are things. Come on, Jay. You know better than to say that. <laughs> None of us are even close to Jesus Christ. Okay. Well, I'm closer every day. Well, no, yeah, that's fair to say. That's fair to say. But I mean, we we, we have an eternity to become more and more like Him. How much? more do I need to be like him? Am I good let enough me, now? Not, Am I me, more enough now? Let me, let me not judge you, but let me say myself, I think I have a long ways to go. Well, what if the mind of Jesus is being in harmony with everybody, that we don't fight, we don't yell at each other, That's we don't... Start. That's a part of it, yeah. But, but what if it's like that all the time? I mean, yeah. I mean... Yeah. That's it, the way it will be people, in heaven. People keep keep thinking that, okay, I got to be thinking exactly like you or no. else there's trouble. No, no, no. And um, the trouble doesn't have to come because of that, does it? No, no, it doesn't. Well, why can't I respect you for who you are? Yeah. And then if you have a difference of opinion, I'll say, well, he'll learn as time goes on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, and you can say that to me, of but, course. But, but of I course. like I like the the way the Good News Bible translates Paul in in his letters when he talks about reconciliation, and it's it's one word. It's a word that that I like. It's it's a bit abstract. It, it would be one that we could talk about, but it is living in union with Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. and if we live in union with Him we will be adopting his mind. We will understand things from his perspective. Yeah. Isn't that a state of at one -ment? Yes. A, t a word that Tyndale coined years ago, which has been messed up by theologians and called atonement as though it's a payment of something to, to change yeah. God's mind. Well, let, there's some things we can be sure about. We can approach that status to Bible study, prayer, and witnessing, and that's what we're talking about, okay? Jesus did it himself, and he instructed his first disciples how to do it. So, just scratch your brains for a moment. How many times did Jesus meet people from other nations and other cultures in his ministry that we know about? You mean like say the non-Jewish? Well, yeah, non-Jewish, yeah. Well, just walking down this street in that part of the world, he would run into uh, Romans. Okay, Romans. And you said what? <coughs> uh, the woman at the well. The woman at the, the well, Samaritan. that's one. Who was a what, Samaritan? The Samaritan, yeah. The Preans over across the... Okay, the he way. spent the last six months of his life, more or less, across mostly, most of the time across the river. Now, over there, there were a number of Jews. But there were also a number of people who were Greek and other things like that. Up in Lebanon, wasn't he up there? Yeah, the Canaanite one. Yeah, yeah exactly. So we know, and, and one of my favorite stories is the, the two demoniacs in Gadara. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not sure what, where Gadara is, and it goes by different names, but you know, that story. And, and he spent how, not many hours with them, did he? No, he spent and a very short period of time. But what's interesting about that, and 
you're blowing my story here, but <laughs> what's interesting about that is he spent a short time with them. He said, go back and tell what the Lord has done for you. He came back about, I should try to calculate exactly, I mean, a few months later, I don't know exactly how many months later, and the whole place came out to see him. And he preached to them for three months, and at, I mean, not three months, I'm sorry, three days, and he, um, at the end of that time, he says, these people are going to faint on the way home. We've got to feed them. He fed, he fed 5,000 men, not counting women and children, because of the witness of one or possibly two. Matthew says two. The others say one. It's that, amazing I, what truth can do, what yeah. the impact of truth on a receptive mind can yeah. accomplish. Well, what about the Old Testament? Can you think of times when God talks about uh, mission and reaching out and about the Messiah, what he might do in the Old Testament? Jonah and Nineveh. Okay, Jonah. That's an interesting one. Okay. Genesis 3.15 is one of the famous ones. You're going to well, bruise a serpent's head. Uh, Isaiah 7.14. What's Isaiah 7.14 say? Well, you know how it's translated in the King James because of the influence of Matthew 1. <laughs> a virgin shall conceive and give birth to... That's not what Isaiah says, but that's the way they interpret it in the New Testament. Isaiah 42, Isaiah 53, Isaiah 61. There's a lot of Messianic stuff in Isaiah. Daniel 9 talks about a very specific time when Jesus is going to arrive. And then Micah 5, 2, what does that say? Do you remember? The place, Bethlehem. The place, Bethlehem. Zechariah 9, what does that say? I'm getting, I'm, I'm really asking you to scratch your brains now. This is the place where it says he's going to come riding on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Well, to summarize, just if you put all those verses together and you sort of look at what does it say, it teaches that he's going to lift up the oppressed. He's, come, he's going to come at exactly the time prophesied about him. He's going to forgive sin. He's going to establish justice. See, I put all these verses together. He's going to fulfill vision and prophecy. He's going to rededicate the temple. What would that mean? Would that mean he's going to cleanse the temple, maybe? Try to suggest it should be used for the right thing. He will come down to be with us. He will set people free. He will open the eyes of the blind. He will bring light to the nations. He will crush the head of the serpent by revealing the truth. And that's just the beginning. It's quite a list, huh? So, I've often wondered what Jesus said on the road to Emmaus. Yeah, don't we wish is, we knew. Is, is this what he was talking about? Is this some examples of, do you, out remember, of the or you remember he was going to come and heal the sick and raise the dead and, and so on and so forth, cleanse the temple? I mean, I just put together a preliminary list mm -hmm. of stuff that I quoted from those very verses that are mentioned there. Yeah. <clears throat> so, the creator of the universe chose to identify with us so much that he took upon himself humanity and he's never going to give that up in order to answer the issues and the great controversy with irrefutable evidence. We can choose to let God help us to live the kind of life he lived or we will die the kind of death he died. Those, that's our choice. Well, even in the Old Testament there are passages suggesting that the gospel was supposed to go to the Jews only? No, to the entire world. But with the coming of Jesus, even in connection with his birth and dedication, the focus of God was to carry the gospel from the base, and what would the base be? The Jewish nation, it was, that's what it was supposed to be. By the way, were the Jewish nation ever told that they were supposed to carry the gospel to the world? Mm -hmm. yeah. When they came to Palestine, what were they supposed to do there? Yeah, be in the center of commerce and where everybody moved through and evangelized. Initially, yeah. they were supposed to drive everyone out, weren't they? <laughs> well, the, no, the bees were supposed to drive, or the hornets were supposed to drive everybody out. And then they were supposed to evangelize them. That's what Exodus 23, read it for yourself. That's 
That's what it says. Unfortunately, things changed dramatically before the end of those 40 years. Well, the I, focus of... I, I've been amazed going through the Old Testament how many times it said, you know, to people of the whole, of all nations, or a paraphrasing of that. Yeah. You know, it, and we just overlook that. Yeah. Totally. We just read right past it. Yeah. Yeah, right over. Well, look at Luke 2, 8 to 14, 25 to 33, 3, 3 to 6, and John 1, 29. Those are just, you know, this, the, the passages that talk about Jesus' birth, his dedication at the temple, all the way up to including his, um, his recognition by John the Baptist at, at his baptism. And what do we, what do we see? What do, what do we find there? Remember some of the quotes? What did Simeon say? What did Anna say? About Even what did the angel say to Mary about what Jesus was going to do? Do you remember? This wasn't supposed to be a trick save question. People from their sins. <laughs> He's supposed to bring joy to all people. He's supposed to save people from their sins. He's supposed to be a light to reveal God's will to the Gentiles. That was mentioned right at the beginning of his life. And bring glory to his people Israel. Now what would it mean to bring glory to his people Israel? Well, that would be glory in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. The whole world was supposed to see God's salvation. And you remember John's statement, what? The Lamb of God to do what? Take away the sins of the world. Do you think anybody there listening that day had any idea that he was talking about the whole world? No. Probably not. Probably not. Their idea of the whole world that, uh, that God was supposed to reach out to was what? The Jewish nation, right? Judea mm -hmm. anyway, may, and maybe up to Galilee, but maybe not. And how did they, what did they perceive that that meant, the taking away of the sins of? Well, they had an elaborate system at the temple <coughs> for taking away sins. You come and you confess your sins over the lamb and the, his throat is caught and they collect the blood and they, they go through that whole process. And here's a, here's a human lamb. I don't know whether they thought that he was going to actually be sacrificed at the altar in Jerusalem. I don't know what they thought about that part, but they had, they had a way of, they knew about a way of taking away sins. So. Well, since this is a lesson about mission, are we to have the same mission that Jesus, could you describe the mission of Jesus, first of all? Could you in a one or two sentences say, this was the mission of Jesus? Jesus said what his mission was just when he was there at the uh, Garden of Gethsemane. He says, I've accomplished the work you gave me to do. I've made known your character. And says, you've the seen, character of the Father. The he says, you've God. seen me, you've seen the Father. Yeah. And he was also known as Almighty God. So, so that would mean the mission is to <clears throat> reveal the character of God. Yeah. yeah. Well, That's not what... The reason, uh, my understanding as to why that is important is because it's a law of human nature. You become like the person or thing that you worship or admire. Yeah. And if you have an arbitrary, vengeful, unforgiving, exacting, severe, tyrannical, despotic God, what was that you again? become like that. <laughs> 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 well, it's, it's the way things work. Yeah, yeah. Ken, I've, I've, I've thought about your question, uh, and I've used it a time or two. Okay. Um, if we could distill what God is trying to accomplish into one simple sentence, mm -hmm. what, would, what would that sentence be? I mean, what, 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 what is God's basic intention? Mm -hmm. um, and I've come to the conclusion, and I've, I've shared it with, with several, that uh, the, his, his goal is to restore harmony throughout the universe. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's his, his basic intention. That's the goal. That's the goal. That's what he's trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. Now, if we understand that, then it's easier to explain his, his actions, his behaviors, 
uh, as have been revealed to us and recorded for us. But if we, if, if, if our focus is, um, I, I hate to use the term, so narrow that we only focus on our own salvation, yeah. um, we, miss, we, we, we run the risk of missing the point of what he's trying to accomplish. But aren't we the only ones with a problem? Well, no. we're not the only ones with questions, I'll, I'll put it that way. We may be the only ones that have rebelled. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, well, that's not even true. What about Satan and his friends? Well, the, the only humans that rebelled, but, but there, there is that contingent of angelic beings which have also rebelled, which, as I understand it, are, are quarantined mm -hmm. uh, to, to this earth at this time. Um, yes, but, uh, but even, uh, even the beyond those, there are angelic beings, maybe beings on other, other uh, inhabited planets that uh, would have questions about the character of God. Uh, Satan made those accusations, yeah. uh, and so those, those questions and, exist. And quite persuasively. He yes. Made those yeah. Yes. Uh, I mean, to, to think about carrying a third of the angels of heaven with him. Yeah. Okay. You know, put, put it in terms. You know, think about someone corrupting or or stealing away a third of the U.S. military might. Yeah. Th that would be a huge accomplishment. And that was just a third that were willing to commit. A lot of the others apparently had many questions, and were on the fence. That's right. That's right. When well. We so what should be our response to all that? And, and of course, the real question is, is our mission the same as Jesus's was? Or should it be? Maybe I shouldn't say, well, is it? Should it be? Jesus' mission was, it's, uh, Paul says it, that it was accomplished in, in Colossians 1, 19 and 20, and Ephesians 1, 9 and 10, and 3, 9 and 10. Uh, and uh, he says that his mission was accomplished at Jesus' death. That was for the benefit of the beings in the heavenly places, mm -hmm. my understanding. Well, and but 3, 9, and 10 still says they're supposed to still be learning from us. That's true. So by default, even, even the bad ones among in this earth are still helping uh, make God's case. Well, Ellen White said this about that, Testimonies for the Church, Volume 6, page 29. The missionary spirit needs to be revived in our churches. Every member of the church should study how to help forward the work of God, both in home missions and in foreign countries. Scarcely a thousandth part, one thousandth part of the work is being done that ought to be done in missionary fields. God calls upon his workers to annex new territory for him. There are rich fields of toil waiting for the faithful worker. Is that scary enough? I don't quite understand it. <laughs> well, she, of course, was writing from, from Australia at that point in time. I'm quite sure if I'm, I should check the date, but I'm pretty sure. Was, and she looked out and she said, man, we haven't touched Australia. So she's saying lesson one. I mean, we weren't doing any, in those days, we weren't doing anything in Africa. We weren't doing anything in Asia. We weren't doing, so, I mean, we were, we were a church of about maybe 10,000 members at that point. So, so what's we've, the got, we've got churches, Go work. churches Go all over creation now. Mm -hmm. So well, not that, all over, that but well, pretty well. So, but that statement really, really is. So it, is this out of date? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think so. Again, if, if we don't understand what, what Jesus' mission was, right. that is the restoration of harmony throughout the universe mm -hmm. by or through revealing who God is or what he is really like, that Satan's charges are, are uh, fallacious. Yeah. Um, uh, then we want to, uh, and I, I guess I see Jesus as trying to win people to his side of that divide. I was tempted to put a very important quotation in here that we've quoted a number of times, but and you can only put so much into one of these lessons. But for those of you who have access to one of the CD-ROMs or some of the older volumes from Ellen White, 
Signs of the Times, January 20, 1890, has one incredible statement in it which says, the entire mission of Jesus, she says this three times, the entire mission of Jesus was to correctly represent the Father. But we, I wonder where that fits, uh, where we fit into that. So, so if if that was his mission, mm -hmm. um, and we, we pick that mission up, uh, we should be trying to to win converts to his side of the what we call the great controversy. Yeah. But I suspect that what she's referring to uh, here in uh, Volume Six uh, of the Testimonies is is that that we focus on on what we have to do to be saved and. Um, we, tend, we tend to focus on what's going on in our church. Our focus is very much inside. What can we do for the church? And we're not very good at reaching out. Are there, are there any Old Testament um, examples of people who accomplished uh, this? Outside of maybe Job. Did well, Moses? Well, Moses did a pretty good job, didn't he? Well, I don't know, and I'm thinking about Abraham and some of the mm -hmm. stupid things he did, and about and, Elijah, mm -hmm. and and you know, and then in, in in the New Testament, you know, Paul's a pretty good guy, but he did some silly things too, and so maybe. But aren't these one guy out of a big bunch of people all through history? Mm -hmm. So you're making the question that. Um, how come all of us aren't doing it? And you asked whether there was an instance in the Bible where that was happening, and mm -hmm. there isn't. And that's why we're still here. What? <laughs> yeah. So we if just well, need somebody to do that? Well, lot, what's going to change that? What's well, going to change that? Well, that's the that? question. If there were a whole lot of us correctly representing God and doing the missionary work we should be doing, we wouldn't be here anymore. I agree with that 100%. So? But what I'm <laughs> asking is what is going to be the trigger for that? Yeah. I'm not sure. Is it just, is it just us making the decision? So, like, like that decision was trying to be made all through, clear back to Adam and Eve? Yeah. You know, with all so, of these saints who have gone before and nobody's accomplished this, if that's what we're kind of alluding to here. I, I don't know, I'm not sure. There's some, there, there's some question marks around that concept that I have, I, I don't know. But, well, Gary, I would answer your, your, your question uh, by saying, it'll never happen. It'll never happen. Well, the, the evidence. What is he looking for? Well, the no, evidence but Tim is, says it's gonna happen. Yes, well. Dennis is not done with his comment, yeah. Uh, now we've got to right have harmony view. here, so oh, don't. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, it is, we, we don't end up with harmony in this life. Uh, look at Matthew 25. Yeah. The, 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 the church. You know, who 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 are the the ten women that Jesus was referring to uh, represented in his parable? Uh, they, they're certainly not the heathen. The heathen were not looking for uh, the return of the bridegroom. And uh, the false churches, it, it really can't represent false churches because false churches are represented by impure women. Mm -hmm. So this is pure women, right, virgins, that he's talking about waiting for the bridegroom. And half of them um, don't... All of them were asleep. All of them were asleep, but only half of them seem to have made the grade. Well, why 10? 10 is a number of completeness. Mm -hmm. So. My understanding of that parable is that when Jesus returns, he will find his church asleep and only half of his entire congregation will be prepared. That is, yeah. it will never happen. And, and uh, we, we have a, uh, Revelation 3, same thing. Yeah. Well, there was one thing, one time, when something happened to make a whole bunch of people go out. That was Pentecost. Yeah. So maybe we we're looking for Pentecost to happen. Well, here. we are. Well, um, it's, it's, do you have the, the switch to switch that? No, mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit has that switch. Yeah, okay. but there were, there were people, they went there waiting mm -hmm. for, they were there 
waiting. For they were it. there praying. Yes, well, they, I'd, they, I'd like they were there for that purpose. I'd like to do something a little bit unusual here. <clears throat> I'd like to take you just real briefly through the history of Christ's ministry, chronologically. Many people haven't followed this. The verses are there, but let's just say his early ministry from his baptism to the Cana wedding happened between autumn of AD 27 and, and the spring of AD 28, six months. We know almost nothing about what happened during that time. Then there was a year of his ministry in Judea from the first Passover to his rejection by the Sanhedrin at the second Passover from spring of AD 28 to the spring of AD 29. Now think about what's happening here. At, the, at that point in time, John the Baptist is arrested. They're already trying to figure out how to arrest Jesus, and Jesus says, it's time for me to move to Galilee. His ministry in Galilee begins at the second Passover from the th until the third Passover. He has one year in Galilee, okay? From the spring of AD 29 to the spring of AD 30, until, uh, he, until he's rejected at that point in Galilee. Then he takes his disciples and he says, I need to work on these disciples for a period of time. So six months, he has what's, what's sometimes referred to as his retirement ministry. He takes his disciples out. Once in a while, he comes back to Galilee, but basically he's out. He goes to Tyre and Sidon. He goes to, he goes to Caesarea Philippi, where he asks, Phil, he asks Peter, you know, who do you say I am? So that kind of stuff. And he feeds the, feeds the 4,000 people we talked about a little bit earlier. Then in his last six months, he has a mission to Samaria and Perea from the autumn of 8030 to the spring of 8031. Now, why? And then, of course, there's Passion Week. Think about the sequence. Judea, Galilee, out there, over there, and then finish. Why do you think it happened in that sequence? I suspect he made a lot of enemies. <laughs> <coughs> he did. A lot of people weren't happy about the things he was saying. And it became, literally, it became, I mean, apart from miraculously protecting himself, he, he, they wanted to arrest him and kill him. And what was he saying that irritated them so much? Because he was certainly, a lot of people were following him yes. and rejoicing at what he was and saying. And that's why they couldn't arrest him. He would go to Jerusalem, he would go into the temple, and there were so many people who wanted to hear him that they didn't dare arrest him in front of all those people. <laughs> and, you know, they must have been incredibly frustrated. But you ask why, and uh, I think a, a clear insight as to the why is uh, uh, found in the story of um, his rejection at Nazareth. You know, he, quotes, he quotes Isaiah. Mm -hmm and he just stopped short of the promise that they, they, they hung on to. But so what he said afterwards uh, that, that you have pointed out, that is, is, is so strong, uh, so, so inflammatory, so mm -hmm. in your face. Uh, you know, it's uh, during Elijah's uh, you know, drought, uh, it, uh, it was, it was uh, a Gentile that uh, was blessed by God. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know the history of Naaman. It, it was again a Gentile. It wasn't. It, it wasn't a Hebrew that received God's blessings, and that was like pouring gasoline on fire. Yeah. Well, now why did Jesus do that? Since he was bright enough and had the insight with the Holy Spirit to know what the response would be. And I'm not wanting to to cast a, a dispersions on this, this concept of harmony. But what we're seeing here is some disharmony. Didn't Jesus say, I came to bring not peace, but a sword? No, it is. And his effort to, to bring about some harmony, <clears throat> there is some consequential disharmony. And at the beginning, in his early ministry, well, in his early ministry in Galilee, he told his disciples, I want you to go out and speak only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And he told them that you can do what? Do you remember? Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead. Can we do that? 
And I guess if you can, let me know. I guess what I'm sure we can. I guess what <laughs> my thrust here is that is that when I take your concept of, of harmony, and I like it, I really like the way you synthesize things there, just because as I'm seeking harmony, I may run into some disharmony, that doesn't mean necessarily that I'm doing the wrong thing. Yeah. But, but let me be clear. <coughs> harmony will not be restored On this until end. after mm -hmm. the third coming. Yeah. At that point, harmony will be restored. But that's the goal. That's what, that's the objective. That's what, what God is after. And, and just as, as that was Jesus' goal, as he performed his ministry, that's my ultimate goal as well as I perform my ministry. That's how I understand it. So how well are our churches and our Sabbath schools doing at um, <coughs> this kind of mission? And unfortunately, it's so easy to get wrapped up in programs that involve us. We're busy. I'm, you know, we're doing things. We're teaching Sabbath school classes, and we're holding. Sa um, we're, we're standing up in front, and we're singing special music, and we're doing all those things. I want to go back to healing the sick and raising the dead and all okay. of that stuff. And you ask, could we do that? And and evidently, we can do that. Mm -hmm. because we've been, I mean, that's the directive is to go do that, and I don't think it was just to Peter and Paul. Um, <coughs> but w when, when, is that, when does that happen? Um, you know, I've been thinking, a lot of the miracles that Jesus did, they were kind of like the demoniacs you mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. Those are pretty <coughs> desperate circumstances. It seemed like when miracles occur, a lot of times the miracles occur, there was, there was uh, some out of the normal circumstances which it was necessary in order to do these things in order to accomplish, accomplish the goal. Well, so, I, if I can interrupt for just a second. If you look at the Bible carefully, there are three times when there's a lot of miracles happen in the Bible. There were all times when the truth about God, when the, when the real witness about God, the understanding of God was at almost all time lows. Right, yeah, yeah. So, there could be two answers in response to your, the, in, the intimated question there, should we be doing these things, is that <clears throat> the time is here, but we're not we're not safe enough to turn that kind of power loose on, or the time is not necessarily, and that's the way I think about it. I don't think I'm, the reason I'm not doing these things is because if God kind of gave me those powers, I'd be going around zapping the wrong people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> okay. Well, <clears throat> in Matthew 5, Mark 14, Luke 14, Mar Matthew 13, various iterations here, we're told through various parables and through the Sermon on the Mount, that we're supposed to be light, and we're supposed to be salt, and we're supposed to be do various things, basically be out there in the world and, and carrying God's message. Are we doing that? I'm not sure we are. <coughs> okay, we mentioned already Pentecost. Let's, let's really drill down here now. What happened between the resurrection and the Pentecost that made that incredible difference? Or wasn't there anything? Was it, was it just happened at Dennis? Well, the answer that, uh, that I offer to, to that question is they had time to think about their experience over the last two, three, three and a half years. And they came to the conviction, the, the, the understanding that their friend that they had spent so much time with was really God. <coughs> <coughs> they had a fruit basket upset. That's right. And in that time, uh, as they were trying to e examine their experience, they, they uh, gave up uh, some of their selfishness. You mean I can't be prime minister? 
Well, <coughs> that, that, that attitude hung on surprisingly long, but they resolved so many of the differences among themselves. Yeah. And yet minutes before the ascension, they said are you, to Jesus, are you now going to restore your, the kingdom to Israel? If I said surprisingly long, they held on to that attitude. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> well, can you ask, aren't we doing it? Um, just for rebuttal, I'm going to say yes, we are doing it. Um, for example, our educational system at the Adventist Church, we have <coughs> the most expansive educational system planet, uh, a Protestant educational system on the planet. Yeah. <coughs> I remember HMS Richard saying, somebody commented to them, him that no matter where I go in the world, I see two organizations. I see the, the Goodyear Rubber Company and I see the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Mm -hmm. So... That's a good sign. Is, it's, is, that, is that an answer to your question or are you intimating other things? Well, <laughs> let me... <coughs> let, me, let me stop it for a moment and say, there's a few of us here. What, there's eight of us here. Suppose we could add three more of us here. What would we do if Jesus showed up right now and says, okay, I'm assigning you 11 to carry the gospel to the world? And next, then my next question is going to be, okay, now we have one wonderful <coughs> lady here. Myra's with us. The rest of us have, have had wives or have wives. If we, uh, what would you go home and tell your wife if or your husband, if you had just been told, okay, your job is to carry the gospel to the world? I would say that you were dreaming. <laughs> you would say that to God? No, I'd say it to you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because Jesus told his disciples to go after he taught them for years personally. Mm -hmm. And where after they got it all wrong, they got the message well, all wrong. No, no, wait, wait, wait. wait. <laughs> Now, where do you come with a parallel where we have been taught by him personally for so many years, like they did? We what's, have. What's the New Testament? Yeah, we have. We Testament? have more evidence. I don't care. Look we, at the. Per I would rather have him teach me personally you know, ah, than the New uh, Testament. No, he, you know? That's not the, what Jesus said in, Li in Luke uh, 16. <coughs> Remember with the story of Abraham or the rich man of Lazarus? Mm -hmm. And he says, no, they have Moses and the prophets. And then on the road to Emmaus, he went up through Moses and the prophets. That's the way the learning has to but be done. That's still the old not getting my point. He was the one that was doing all they that. They didn't yes. have it. He yes. was the one. He was the one going down the road of Emmaus, teaching these people. Mm -hmm. And here you're you're dreaming that he's going to come in here and point to you yeah, yeah. and say, "Go out," just like they did I'm to the disciples. I'm, I'm, I'm not. I'm just. The only reason I'm saying that is because he did that to them. I know, and that's my point. The point is that they have the background for it, and we don't. Uh, and they had it all wrong. But you see, there's the problem. Yeah. You have as much background as they do. More. I a lot more. more. I don't agree with that. You I don't even know where you're coming from on that. Hey, Gary, actually, that was Gary, almost like a death sentence for him. Gary, go back to the, the antediluvians. We read Ellen White that that God himself came down and talked with Adam and Eve, that God himself came down and talked personally with those who feared God. Angels came and talked personally with the antediluvians. And what happened? Well, All well, but one man. Listen, the only problem with that, Dennis, against him. is that there's nothing in the Bible that, that describes that. Nothing contrary to it. Nothing contrary, but there's all kinds well, of no. other possibilities too. Y your statement but is not now correct. We've he, got, he did that with we've Abraham. Got, he, we know he just, he walked up to Abraham's house and Abraham says, stop by yeah, and have a look meal. At, look at all the stuff and Job, that these disciples Job. went through. They went through years being with him. They, they yep. saw his miracles. They they experienced him being crucified on the cross mm -hmm. and being resurrected again. Mm -hmm. Where in any history did that happen? Right there. Yeah, right there. Okay. But I'm saying anywhere else. 
Do you, because you, you, you are need, you need saying that these... Jesus is going to come in the door and order us to go like, I'm like those saying, disciples did. Hypothetical. I'm just saying, do you need to have one of your friends crucified in order before, before you go out? Well, you want me to volunteer? Why? <laughs> I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. I am saying that they they experience something far beyond what and, we've and ever what, experienced. And what God is saying, I and Jesus Himself says. You know, I don't need to be with you. You're better off if I send you right. my, my word and the Holy Spirit. You're better off than these people who have had me right beside them all their lives. Okay, if that's unless you're true, gonna, unless you're going to disagree probably, with Jesus. No, 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 I'm not going <laughs> to disagree with Jesus. I'm just saying, is, has that happened yet? Mm -hmm. Has that happened yet? Well, it's happened in a few lives, but it hasn't happened on a large scale, and that's what we're talking about. It needs to happen on a on a larger scale. Again, there's 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 one thing you've I, I believe you've left out of your, okay. your par parable here. Please. Okay. Back then, yeah, po uh, apostolic church. It became very uncomfortable for them to stay where they were. Mm -hmm. They were they were motivated. They were really motivated to leave. And when they left, they had something to share. They were very motivated. And I can tell you, Paul says very clearly, if we were living lives like Jesus Christ, we would be persecuted today. That worries me a great deal. Mm -hmm. That's what's going to change the whole yeah. thing is persecution. Well, Matthew 24, 14. Yes? I have. A concern with what Gary's saying, because I understand what he's saying, but the disciples made a choice. Jesus asked them if they wanted to come along, and they made the choice to join him. He's asking us to make that same choice. If we were to follow him and, and study all that he's given to us, would we not have the same information as what they lived and didn't see? Do you think so? I do. Well, and okay. also, if we went out preaching what we think we ought to be preaching, wouldn't that bring about persecution? Very likely. So it's kind of a, a circular, a circular yeah. situation. Well, and it's going to happen someday. <coughs> and I'd like to see it happen in our day. I think it's closer than we think. I got a letter, a non-Adventist business update through the mail very recently and quite plainly it says right there the first amendment as we've understood it and live with it in America is finished not coming it says it's finished mm -hmm. and when you look at and you brought this up in your classes here and there when you look at some of the stuff that's happened very recently in some of the major courts when that finally goes and then they drop Sunday in the middle of that Mm -hmm. It's going to start like you'll never believe. Yeah. Well, we know, unless you absolutely deny the Word of God, that the second coming is coming. So we're not supposed to set dates. Please, let's not even think about doing that. Uh, how would you compare the obstacles which the early apostles met when trying to spread the gospel with the obstacles we face today? Gary, here's your question. <laughs> with the obstacles? Yeah. What, I mean, they went out with nothing. And, and they said, Jesus said, I want you to go to the world, and if you don't go, I'll send persecution. And finally, they, after three and a half years, the persecution descended upon them with violence. And they said, well, I guess we better go. Well, you got to remember that there was Pentecost. Yeah. The they, Spirit they didn't, came down in yeah. a roar. Three and, it took them three and a half years before they moved, and they moved only when there was persecution. Well, you mean That's after, what, after the Pentecost, but then everything died down until they... No, they were doing things... I think things, the Pentecost made the persecution blow it up, blow up their situation. Well, and that's what made them f go all over the place. What made the... The spirit started then, yeah. and it's, it's, it's something that we're no. not seeing today yet. And you can't just generate it by just going, saying, okay, I'm going to leave today and go out to Africa mm -hmm. and do my part. Mm -hmm. Well, it's good to do that. There's, don't get me wrong about that. But I think the thing that's going to come to really end things 
is going to be this rain that we have no control over it coming. And God's going to send it when it comes. Okay, let's be very honest. You look at the biblical record. What happened was they stoned Stephen. Mm -hmm. And Paul says, okay, we're going to get rid of these people. And he went out from door to door trying to identify Christians and saying, okay, who are we going to kill? Who are we going to arrest? And so forth like that. That's what caused the explosion, not Pentecost. You don't think that the spirit that came to Stephen in the first place, it got them all riled up in the first place? It has nothing to do with it? Oh, I, the message was there. They just weren't doing anything with it. Didn't do anything. But, but Stephen was seeing God coming well, in the, sure. the air. I mean, this was but, not but him just was, making his imagination. Yeah. The spirit was coming down on him. But and what? they were closing their ears, telling them, to, shut up, shut up. Yeah. I don't think there was a lull in that time. I think, well, I think the Spirit was. came, yeah. and it kept going that whole yeah. time. You need to reread the book of Acts. I in, read the book of Acts. Day, the, the disciples and the apostles had to physically go to every town, right. every city. We have a tool, a yeah. weapon, called the Internet, which... ISIS is using for terrible things, mm -hmm. yes. but we can use it for good. Yeah, the thing that the, the thing that I we can the, go everywhere. There's a there's a lot that we aren't told in the Bible. If you look in Josephus and some of the other relevant provable history of Christ's time, mm -hmm. before he was there, there were other messiahs that came and went, and Rome started to get a bit itchy over that. And Christ warned them that the temple was going to be laid flat and what have you. Rome put up with a tremendous amount of irritability, shall I say, from the Jewish nation as it then was. And yeah. it got to the point they said, thus far and no further, and they clobbered them. That's when the disciples started to move out. So they it had, to. had nothing to do with the Spirit. I didn't say that. No. They well, had had it, but they hadn't moved. He's right. Yeah. And you can read it in the history. Rome did, they laid back trying to put well, up with this I stuff. And then the they spirit, said, it's got to go. If the spirit was there, I probably wouldn't move either unless something pushed me. Well, that's what's going to happen. Even if the spirit was there anyway. Yes. Uh, I know several people who are, who are waiting for the spirit. They're looking for an experience. Um, no, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. No, but he's okay. saying he knows people okay. like that. Okay, but you're not, you're not paralleling what I'm saying, but go ahead. Okay. Uh, and, and so they're looking for uh, a personal outpouring of the Spirit. Uh, they want to be personally touched. Um, they, they would like to, to invoke the, the latter rain, the Holy Spirit. But I suspect two things. I suspect that God will not pour out His Spirit on us until we are prepared to represent Him like He would like to be represented. That's right. And secondly, He secondly, can't bless us to, to say the wrong things about Him. That's right. And secondly, the Spirit is That's being again. poured out <laughs> today. People in modern times, in our lifetime, are raising through the Spirit, people to life. Yeah. So what are we waiting for? Mm -hmm. the, the Spirit is available. It's just that we are, and I'll quote on White again, we, we are contaminated oh. vessels. The Spirit cannot be poured into contaminated vessels. Look at Second Peter 3. You don't have to go to Ellen White, although I, I trust her, but Second Peter 3, that's what it says. How about uh, Second Timothy 3, verse 3, it talks about slanderers. I mean, if you're not telling the truth about God, aren't you slandering his reputation? Yeah. That's the worst, the worst form of slander you could do. Mm -hmm. So how do you become an, un, an uncontaminated vessel? Well, that's where back to the Bible study, prayer, <coughs> and witnessing. And you, some people would say, well, I, Bible study and prayer, I understand. What's the witnessing have to do with it? And I'll tell you, there's a very specific answer to that. If you want to know whether you understand, just let me take, for example, any given doctrine within the church sit down and try to explain it to someone else. That's what the witnessing is about. You will not get the message clearly until you have to try to explain it to somebody else. So the witnessing, it's important for those people out there, 
it's even more important for us. We need to say, I mean, I will bet that if you take the average Adventist and say, explain to me doctrine X, they'll go, the, 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 well, I believe the, 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 the. I'm less concerned about what you believe. I'm more concerned about how you support your belief. Yeah. What are, what are the, your, your uh, arguments, your, your beliefs based on? Ellen White said, and I quote, this is from Ministry of Healing, page 143, Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching the people. The Savior mingled with men as one who desired their good. He showed his sympathy for them, ministered to their needs, and won their confidence. Then he bade them, follow me. There is need of coming close to the people by personal effort. If less time were given to sermonizing and more time were spent in personal ministry, greater results would be seen. What do you suppose that means? Get out amongst it. Preachers should talk less and do more. <laughs> hey, now just a minute. Yeah, you and me. <laughs> For a pothole there. Jesus clearly did not just preach his message to people. He lived it. He ministered to every need that he saw. When the right time comes, we can promise people what Jesus promised them. Complete healing, physically, mentally, socially, emotionally, and spiritually. And when will that happen? At the second coming. It may not be right now. Some will be healed right now. But for those who accept him into their lives, the results are absolute. As they would conquer another territory, the Romans would send in, a, in with the general and his troops a legate. What's a legate? It was the legate's responsibility to arrange peace terms, to determine boundaries, to drop constitutional provisions. His goal was to bring them into the family of the Roman Empire. Could we do such a thing in our day? What kind of terms would you draw up for bringing someone into the gospel? Are we capable of bringing people into the family of God? Or is that the work of the Holy Spirit only? What would Jesus want us to do? If we were sent out, and Gary's not going to like this, if we were sent out, just said, go, spread the word, gospel to the world, what would we do? And my friends, what would you do? Our kind and loving Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have to speak about you and to discuss these terms of the gospel. May what we say be a blessing to those that are able to listen and ponder, and we thankful that we're thankful that many do. In Jesus' name. Thank you.